This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight, we apply our patent-pending Stanley Rubrik to The Kane Mutiny from 1954, directed by Edward Dimitrik, written by Stanley Roberts and Michael Blankfort, starring Humphrey Bogart, Jose Ferrer, Fred McMurray. However, quickly before we get to the show... Next week, we will be discussing the last entry on our Military Courtroom Drama Month, Judgment at Nuremberg from 1961, directed by Stanley Kramer, written by Abby Mann, starring Maximilian Schell, Spencer Tracy, Judy Garland, Marlena Dietrich, Montgomery Clift, and Burt Lancaster. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com to sign up for our newsletter. Or you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, or now TikTok at the handle at gmodepodcast. And as always, please like, follow, rate, and review the show on whichever podcast platform you use. We would really appreciate it. All right, Dad, the Kane Mutiny. I have almost no relationship to this movie that isn't through you. So what is your relationship to this movie? This was a movie that was on my list to watch probably back in the early 90s when we were dirt poor and um, didn't have much else. I used to uh, program and record movies off of uh, on cassette or on VHS tapes. This is how long ago uh, that were usually on AMC back when AMC actually showed old movies. And I recorded this and watched it, I think, for the first time with your mother it might have been at a point where you were sleeping in a bassinet or a car seat yet and uh, with a bowl of popcorn. I absolutely loved the film, and it's been a staple of mine pretty much every 12 to 18 months since. Okay. So what is this movie about then? The Stress of War and Betrayal. I mean, I guess it kind of hits at some of the themes I wanted to cover, But to me, this has more to do with leadership or people in leadership positions than anything else. Well, maybe you're right. Maybe instead of the stress of war, I'm talking about leadership and the avoidance of leadership or cowardice, heroism and cowardice. Well, I don't want to make it a referendum on whether or not Captain Quig was a coward, because certainly Jose Ferrer goes out of his way in the movie to say he is not. He would not have risen to that position. But That's I don't want to... I'm saying as a coward. Okay. The coward is McMurray. Yeah, all right. I could I could grant you that on this or on that particular front. I don't know. To me, this struck more than anything as a... I guess a projection of if I were in this situation and I questioned the leadership competence of my superior, would I step in, particularly in a qualifier such as this, that is a sinking ship moment? I've had those situations and the answer for me mostly is yes. And sometimes it's not to take charge, but to support the whoever is in charge and help prop them up. And that's the difficulty of this movie is it presents it so black and white as to what the correct answer should be. Oh, no, it doesn't. No, it really does. Because the crew had or the officers had an opportunity. Quig asked for help and they turned him down. Except he didn't ask for help. Okay, well, as much as he could have. (laughs) Okay, but would he have actually accepted the help? I mean, that's the position. It, you're already getting into where I didn't necessarily want to go this soon, which is the questions that I have to the central flaw of this movie. Okay, well, fine. You get back on your track. I'm not even sure where to go from here. Well, I don't know. I mean, I have a plot summary if you'd like it. Sure, let's start off with that and give everybody the context before we continue to name drop. In the middle of World War II, 
Out in the Pacific Theater, we find a tired and weary minesweeper of the Keen when a new captain, Philip Francis Quig, Humphrey Bogart, is assigned to the Keen. The officers note his strange behavior, which may be his efforts to instill discipline or a much deeper problem. Concerned about his behavior, the executive officer, Lieutenant Steve Merrick, Van Johnson, is convinced by the communications officer, Lieutenant Tom Kiefer, Fred McMurray, the Quig may have a mental illness. When the cane is in serious danger during a typhoon, Merrick assumes command under Article 184 of the Navy regulations when Quig's behavior appears to risk the ship and the crew. This action results in a court-martial where Merrick is represented by Lieutenant Barney Greenwald, Jose Farrar. Was Merrick justified, or did he commit mutiny? Thank you. Cast for this movie, Edward Dimitrik as director, Stanley Roberts and Michael Blankfort as writers, Humphrey Bogart as LCDR, Philip Francis Quig, Jose Ferrer as Lieutenant Barney Greenwald, Van Johnson as Lieutenant Steve Merrick, Fred McMurray as Lieutenant Tom Kiefer, Robert Francis as Ensign Willis Seward Willie Keith, May Wynn as May Wynn, Tom Tully as LCDR William H. DeVries, E.G. Marshall as LCDR John Challey, Arthur Franz as LTJG H. Painter Jr., and Lee Marvin as Meatball. Recognition for this movie, The Keen Mutiny was released on July 28, 1954. It was made on a budget of $2 million, was the second highest grossing film of 1954, and earned $8.7 million in theatrical rentals in the United States. It was also the most successful of Kramer's productions, some of which had previously lost money and put his entire production company, as well as Columbia Pictures, in the black. That would be Stanley Kramer, just for reference sake. The Kane Mutiny currently holds a 92% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a 63% on Metacritic. It was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Actor for Humphrey Bogart, Supporting Actor for Tom Tully, Score for Drama or Comedy, Sound, Editing, and Best Screenplay. It has been recognized by the American Film Institute on the following lists. AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movies, it was a nominated film. AFI's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains, Lieutenant Commander Philip Francis Quig was a nominated villain. AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movie Quotes, Ah, But the Strawberries, that's, that's Where I Had Them, was a nominated line. And AFI's 10 Top 10, it was a nominated courtroom drama film. Did you know? The fate of the USS Hull, one of three U.S. Navy destroyers lost during Typhoon Cobra in December 1944, served as the basis for the mutiny in the story. According to his first-hand account, Boatswain's mate first class, John Ray Schultz, directly confronted Hull's commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander James A. Marks, about his handling of the ship as she was entering the worst of the typhoon. Schultz implored Hull's XO, Lieutenant Greel Gerstley, an expert ship handler, to assume command, but he refused, citing fear of a court-martial for mutiny. Other surviving witnesses on the bridge described Marx as paralyzed and indecisive, issuing questionable maneuvering orders and declining to take on leveling ballast to help keep the ship upright after several rolls, a decision his exo strongly had disagreed with. A powerful gust exceeding 100 knots eventually rolled hull over onto her side, and she did not recover. The ship flooded rapidly, and 202 of her crew were lost. 62 others were subsequently rescued, including Captain Marks. A board of inquiry did not find fault with Marks, none of the incidents on the bridge were brought up by anyone, but rather with Admiral Halsey for sending his fleet directly into the massive storm, although no disciplinary action was recommended. Some of the survivors of the hull laid the blame for the ship's loss exclusively on the captain. James Marks committed suicide in 1986. Did you know? The film is often cited as a classic example of producer overreach and interference with the creative process involved in making a motion picture. One stark example is writer-producer Stanley Kramer's insistence that Humphrey Bogart be given the role of Quig, even though he was much too old for the part. Director Edward Dimitrik had already signed on Richard Widmark for the role, but was overruled by Kramer and Widmark was released. 
Another example was Columbia Pictures president Harry Cohn's insistence that the final cut run no more than two hours so that it could be squeezed in for an additional showing at theaters, increasing box office receipts. This ran counter to Dimitrik's argument that the story would suffer if it were forced into a compromised two-hour time slot, but he lost this argument as well as 50 pages of dialogue were eliminated to accommodate Cohn's mandate. If Dimitrik had prevailed, the film would have run at least an hour longer. Did you know? Columbia Pictures was determined to hire Humphrey Bogart for the lead role of Captain Quig, and Bogart was enthusiastic about playing it, but the Columbia brass did not want to pay him his top salary. Bogart was rather miffed at this, complaining to wife Lauren Bacall, this never happens to Gary Cooper or Cary Grant or Clark Gable, but always to me. Bogart believed that Harry Cohn and company knew that Bogart wanted to play the part so fervently that he would agree to take less money rather than surrender the part to someone else. As it turned out, he was right. Did you know? There was considerable opposition to the casting of Humphrey Bogart since he was much older than Captain Quig was supposed to be. In addition, Bogart was already seriously ill with esophageal cancer, although it would not be diagnosed until January 1956. Did you know? Humphrey Bogart's tour de force performance in the climactic courtroom scene was so powerful that it completely captivated the onlooking technicians and crewmen. After the scene's completion, the company gave Bogart a round of thunderous applause. Did you know? The U.S. Navy was never happy about the depiction of Captain Quig as a madman in the novel, with the implication that it would hire or keep in place someone so clearly deranged. The film version skirted around that rather contentious issue by making Quig a victim of battle fatigue or PTSD. Did you know? The scene in which Merrick dives into the water to attach a rope to the adrift sweep gear nearly proved fatal for Van Johnson. He did not use a stunt double and performed the entire swim sequence himself. The scene was filmed in the waters outside Pearl Harbor where sharks were known to inhabit. To protect the actor, the Navy had placed armed sailors on the ship and in boats around Johnson as he swam. At least one shark was sighted approaching him, but was quickly shot by the marksman and the shark vanished. Did you know? The scars on Van Johnson's face in this film are real and not makeup. While filming A Guy Named Joe from 1943, Johnson was in an automobile accident and thrown through the car's windshield. The plastic surgery of the day could not totally remove his scars. In all of his later films, he wore heavy makeup to hide them, but felt that, in this film, they added to his character's appearance. Did you know? Several weeks before filming began, Jose Ferrar broke his right hand. He is seen wearing a cast, but the injury is only briefly referred to by Lieutenant Steve Merrick, Van Johnson, when, upon meeting him, he must shake his left hand rather than his right. Did you know? Producer Stanley Kramer and director Edward Dimitrik cast Lee Marvin as one of the USS Kane's supporting sailors, not only for his knowledge of ships at sea, he had served in the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II, but for his acting talent. Throughout the production, Marvin served as an unofficial technical advisor to the filmmakers. Sometimes a shot would be set up only to be criticized by Marvin as being inauthentic. Did you know? When Michael Caine, born Maurice Micklewhite, first became an actor, he adopted the stage name Michael Scott. He was later told by his agent that another actor was already using the same name and that he had to come up with a new one immediately. Speaking to his agent from a telephone box in Leicester Square... In London, he looked around for inspiration. Being a fan of Bogart, he noted that the Kane Mutiny was being shown at the Odeon Cinema and adopted a new name from the movie title. Kane has often joked in interviews that, had he looked the other way, he would have ended up as Michael 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> With that, let's take our first break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. Dad... Before we left off for the break and had done all of our background on this movie, we were kind of consumed with the topic of where this movie, I guess, rests on its performances and its potential flaws. So that will come back up here in the next category or the next few topics. But for who for you was the best performer in this movie? Bogart, simply because he had such an, I mean, it would have been easy to go over the top with Quig. Bogart so underplayed it, but just played it right along that edge where he, <laughs> you're you're sitting there and you're Steve Merrick going, is this guy nuts or is he not? And I think Bogart by far presented that, more or less presented that situation perfectly. 
Now, I didn't go with Bogart for my number one best performance in this one. I went with best secondary performance. Part of that has to do with the fact that, unfortunately, it's hard for me to not compare Bogart performances. When you talk about Maltese Falcon or Casablanca, Key Largo, some of his seminal works, this, to me, does not rise to the pantheon of his best work. It would probably be in that next tier. And so... Maybe he's a victim of his own success in how I look at him because I just find that there are a lot better performances he had, even though he's very good in this film. So in other words, the New York Yankees are only as good as the 1927 Yankees and all their other championships are meaningless? Well, you know how I feel about the Yankees. I understand, but that's your logic. I don't know. I certainly don't think this is his best performance of his career as he accomplished more with establishing character templates in both the Maltese Falcon and Casablanca and was a better version of this deranged soul in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which I think is his best performance. He still stands out by his rather genuine performance in the climactic cross-examination and the way he breaks with reality on the stand is gripping And while I believe the close-up where he realizes what he's doing adds a lot to that particular moment, he is so in tune with the character and his struggles in that moment. Yet, again, I find that he doesn't necessarily live up to the promise that he has in some other movies where I feel he is outstanding. And in this one, I just know the potential that he has, and maybe that's a matter of direction or the substance, but... I don't know. There's just something a little bit missing that I can't give him best performance. So in other words, what you're saying is, is he has three performances that make him not just a great actor, but a legend in Hollywood and in the film industry. And that's what you're judging the performance in this by, because quite frankly, you have to judge it by what other actors would have done. I'm I'm familiar with Richard Widmark and you did you know he was I can't imagine Richard Widmark performing this uh, role as well and as subtle and right on the edge, back and forth between, is this guy crazy or is he not? I mean, (laughs) I I just, I think you're being unfair to him. I don't know. Do you really count Tom Hanks' performance in Bridge of Spies or his in Catch Me If You Can as amongst his best performances? No, but I rate them as in relation to other actors, and all I have to do is look at some of the action or films that were done at the same time, and I go, oh, well, that Tom Hanks is great. And on a on a on a bad day, uh, an average Tom Hanks film is better than ninety percent of the actors in Hollywood. Yes, but you also measure Tom Hanks against Tom Hanks when you're that great, when you're at that level. When you're one of the greatest all time at any part of your profession, at a certain point, you lose the ability to be compared to your colleagues. You can only be compared against yourself. So in other words, your only good movies are the films where you've underperformed your entire career. And on this one occasion, you elevated yourself to be outstanding. And yet again, you have proven that you're incapable of actually listening to my argument. I just said, when you are at the top of your profession, you made a comment and an argument that just tried to give me the, well, you're only as good if you've underperformed for your entire career. If you've underperformed for your entire career, you're not one of the best in your profession. So in other words, we're now down to the Dan Aykroyd, Jane Curtin, Tom, you ignorant slut. All right, let's move to my best performance. Please. Mine was Edward Dimitrik. He had one hand tied behind his back with the studio constantly stepping in. The movie should not have worked. There is so much cut out of here compared to the book, at least from what I'm reading in my background and all of my research, and there's clearly a lot missing from this film because it feels somewhat incomplete. I mentioned this to you over the phone before we did the show here, But there just feels so much that could have been explained that if this is a book and you have longer time to set up and tell this intricate, nuanced story, but this feels rushed. They spend so much time on the boat in the beginning, and they give 15 minutes to a relationship that doesn't matter. 
that for whatever reason, this just doesn't pay off in the end in the way it should. It doesn't give me that great climactic moment. I mean, yes, we had it at what? So let's see here. I think it's 124 minutes total. And the movie still adds in those 15 minutes that I already mentioned. We add on a five-minute anticlimactic thing where DeVries comes back for whatever reason. That makes almost no sense. That The ending should have been when Farrar walks out of the room and away from Kiefer. So I, I just don't understand what they did from the structure of this or the writing. But somehow it's a coherent story that a lot of people seem to like. And if you're able to take a bowl of shit and basically polish a turd, well, I think you ought to have best performance. Oh, I can understand your argument, but we did actually get a waterfall from Yosemite in the film. So that in and of itself is quite <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, that, that was one of the was highlights paradise on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Why is May win in this movie at all? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I've watched the movie probably 15 times, and I always ask the same question. If you were to eliminate the the love interest completely, all you're going to end up with is a much tighter, cleaner, more uh, suspense-driven movie. So best secondary performance for you? Oh, Fred McMurray. I love Fred McMurray. I know you do. Oh, he is He is the every guy. He's the guy. He's the next door neighbor. You know that everybody likes, and then is banging the next the the wife next door to him. He's the he's the everybody guy that you know you just kind of like really he's doing that. I mean this this is probably his second most slimy performance. His greatest, of course, oh, no. is the is the uh, uh, apartment where he's double slimy. indemnity is worse than this. Well, double indemnity. He's a villain. Okay, that's in and of itself beyond, you know, that level of performance was just phenomenal. I mean, Billy Wilder got such a great job out of him for that, and he did. And then, I, having watched this and watched The Apartment and growing up watching My Three Sons with Fred McMurray being everybody's laughable, uh, affable father, you kind of like, huh? I mean, this this is a guy who four years or five years later did a film called Flubber, where he's a, an absent-minded professor for Disney. His talent, his talents are phenomenal from his ability to perform just slimy people to then turn around and be just an average guy. But I, it's this look that he has. Just he looks like he's somebody that's just a nice guy and. But yet you can see un the undercurrent where this guy can be an operator. There are very few actors that have such a range that they can imbue a villain as well as playing a comedian. And I don't know of too many others. I know that you have like three of your favorite films that we've just now mentioned. This one, Double Indemnity, The Apartment, where he's the villain. John Lithgow. John Lithgow is a very good example, yes. He's got quite a range, too. And honestly, I know that you haven't seen his really villainous turn in that one season of Dexter, but he was extraordinary. I know. Sometimes I I, I, I wish I could control, like if I had a remote control, and I could put actors in certain things and just make them stretch. Stanley Tucci's that way, too. He's great at comedy, and then you watch Lovely Bones, and you go, ugh, how can you do those two roles and, and be so good at both? One of the other ones I was thinking of is Robin Williams, a guy that we're going to have up on the show in a little bit about over a month. He plays a serial killer in Insomnia. He plays the genie in Aladdin. He goes to Goodwill Hunting, and he's the like very caring, fatherly-like therapist. Or he's doing Good Morning Vietnam, which is a drama disguised in a lot of humor. Or the, the oh, what's the one where he's, one is it One Hour Photo? Okay, yeah. Where he's the obsessive kind of like yes, stalker. Yes, I've watched, a little, I've, I've never seen the entire film all the way through. I should. It's on my list to do. I've watched about half of it, and he so creeped me out that I just went like, ugh, ugh. That's actually a more... 
I don't know, dialed up version of his character in Insomnia. Anyway, most charismatic for you is Jose Ferrar. I, I have never seen anything that he's ever done that I don't find fascinating. Jose Ferrar was had this presence. And you can watch this film and you realize why Jose Ferrar was probably one of the great womanizers in Hollywood in the 40s and 50, or in the 50s and 60s. And not just Hollywood. He did a lot more on stage as Cyrano de Bergerac and other performances. He just had a presence. I mean, even a, or even as a man, you almost want to swoon sometimes when you watch him because of his command. He has some sort of macho-ness about him that is, he's just got an ability to command a room and to command a situation. You certainly went in an area I didn't expect with that one, but I also had Jose Ferrar, and it's for very different reasons. The way he plays both sides of the story are endearing, as well as the way he takes down Kiefer in the end. But I will say there is not often much more heroic in cinema than a confident defense attorney who is defending the perceived innocent. Yeah. He's likable, and you need him to be because he is the conscience at the end of the movie. True enough. All right, best scene. I have Touring the Cane, Toe Line, Old Yellow Stain, Strawberry Sequence, Not Seeing Admiral Halsey, Typhoon, Court Martial, Kiefer on the Stand, Queeg on the Stand, and The Real Kane Mutiny. Okay. Did I miss any? How do you have the strawberries uh, built into that? I just have it as one kind of longer sequence when you're going from the initial inquiry of the sand and the, I don't know, is it a quart or whatever the measurement of the strawberries is to the ladling out all the way through the, I I guess it would be the other ensign leaving the ship and them trying to look for all the keys and labeling and that. It's just one longer sequence. I mean, you could narrow it down and break those into small parts, but I just kept it kind of packaged together because I think for most people, that's the effect that that gives. If you try and just say them labeling all the keys, it doesn't have as much impact. If you're going to break down one individual scene, as a smaller bit, you could say them ladling the sand into the bowl. All right. So what do you think is the best scene? I really like the typhoon scene because there was so much going on and the performances were so outstanding. I mean, you have Bogart standing there. He's looking like he's freezing and losing control and yet he doesn't. And, you know, going back and forth and, it, it's just well paced. It's you feel like you're there. You feel the tension building. I just think it's a really, really well done scene. I don't know. It was hard for me to look at that without seeing all of the technical difficulties of them trying to film that. I mean, they throw it out or cut back to the ship on the water. And I'm just looking at it like you would almost the USS Enterprise when um, the original cast was on the show. Okay. I mean, it's not quite that bad, but still, I I don't know. Maybe I that mean, took yeah. me out when of it a little bit. At it, when you're looking at it in Blu-ray like I was off of a the disc you gave me for Christmas, yeah, you can tell it's a model. But I mean, at the time, you know, it looked pretty good. So don't go there. Yeah, I know. It just kind of took me out of it, though, a little bit, just because I'm... I'm. A... So you're a jaded New Age guy here that, you know, you got to live in the current world of, of uh, special effects. Well, no, because I wouldn't even say modern day has a great calling on special effects. Special effects are either good or they're not. It just... <laughs> I don't know. It... It's like watching the Planet of the Apes movies and then comparing them to the new ones. Yeah, at least it's not cats. (laughs) They edited out the buttholes. Yes, or you can see uh, Corden's a watch yet in the film. (laughs) That was not the thing I thought you were going to say about James Corden. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay, never mind. 
Something that's not often associated with a feline. Anyway. <laughs> All right. I don't know. It's it's night and day difference between like the Adam West Batman to the Tim Burton Batman to, you know, what we just got a couple of months ago. All right. Sorry. I, it, so I'd be tempted to go with Queeg on the stand. I think it's the seminal moment. It's also my most indelible moment. I think that... Ferrar unfortunately is tasked with that position and he doesn't have to push him by comparison to last week's film that we talked about. And that has a lot of shared similarities. I wouldn't say they're the same movie as you kind of alleged at at one point, but Tom Cruise really has to push Jack Nicholson into that moment in a few good men. It doesn't feel like Jose Ferrar has to push Bogart very far in order to get that confession and that manic moment out of him. Okay, I understand your point, and sometimes skill as a lawyer, a trial lawyer specifically, you don't have to push. You basically know exactly where you're going with this, and you can lead them. And most of the time, if you do it correctly, the witness all of a sudden realizes they're cornered at about seven or eight questions in, and they don't know how to get out. And that's when the anxiety and the, you know, things start rising. And you can see it in Queeg. I mean, you can see the point where he pulls out the ball bearings and starts clicking them in his hand. Farrar didn't have to push him. He walked him very carefully down to a point where all of a sudden Queeg realized he was cornered. And he has to do something to try to get out. So he starts talking and whatever and then it dawns on him, oh, well, I probably I probably overstated this. And then it just kind of hangs there where you're going, wow, okay. Favorite scene for you? It's the cross-examination of Quig. As a trial lawyer who, or well, no, or previously a trial lawyer for 17 years, <laughs> I, I thought, uh, I thought uh, Greenwald did such a, great job of cross-examination and leading the witness right into his uh, point of uh, basically confession. I I just really think that's just an absolutely great moment. Agreed. And your most indelible? When you think about uh, the Cain mutiny, you think about Bogart sitting in the chair and the click, click, click of the ball bearings. All right, this is a good spot for our second break. We will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. Dad, before we get too much further, do we have anyone to remember this week? We do. We have several. Joanna Barnes, uh, American actress, Annie Mame, Tarzan. uh, She was Jane in some of the later Tarzan movies. Spartacus, best known, though, for being the mother in the original Parent Trap and then redeeming a different role but being in the second parent trap she was also a writer and written several novels and other things was a columnist for several newspapers Anne davies an english actress who was in doctor who peter's friends uh the sculptress east enders bob elkins uh american actor coal miner's daughter the dream catcher he was a um, longtime character actor in hollywood We had a very long list of television and movie credits. Neil Adams, uh, an American comic book artist and writer, included him simply because the visuals and the way he drew Batman and others, I think, has some influence in how the films themselves were portrayed and the costuming of Batman. He had a much more updated version of Batman and how Batman should look more sinister at times in some of the later Batman movies. Uh, George Yannick, uh, television writer and producer. Um, he did uh, Hee Haw, uh, Welcome Back, Cotter, and the Stocker Channing Show. He uh, won Emmys in 1974 and 1976. Naomi Judd, uh, country singer, uh, songwriter. Um, some of the Judd songs have been in films, Uh, She's also the mother of Ashley Judd, who is an accomplished actress in her own right. Um, I will comment that uh, 
the daughters uh, all commented that their mother died as a result of mental illness. Um, Ms. Judd um, committed, unfortunately committed suicide. I would just say if you um, are someone out in, in uh, the public who listens to this show and you ever feel at a point of despair to that level, please seek help. This is something that uh, exists and permeates through our society and needs to be addressed. And uh, there are people who understand and are willing to help. Lastly, we have Jerry Verdorn, uh, an American actor, was in several um, soap operas, One Life to Live and The Guiding Light. Now, I knew of several of these people. I think I'd seen stuff with, obviously, Joanna Barnes, because I think my sisters rewatched both Parent Traps multiple times over during my adolescence. Ann Davies, I think I might have seen a few things with her. Bob Elkins. I mean, these are people that I knew of for the most part, but not necessarily anybody that I had a certain fondness for. The one lone exception would be, as you mentioned, Neil Adams. And I wanted to take a minute to just kind of expound on, you barely touched the surface of what Neil Adams is really truly responsible for. He turned the page from the more lighthearted Batman of the 1950s and 60s that often was much more comical. And I I would say pretty much was the standard that led to something like the 60s Batman TV show with Adam West and, and ended up turning it into a more gritty realism that was the character that we've been basically living with since about the late 70s to now. Uh, You think about the Dark Knight uh, Returns, the Frank Miller stuff from the 80s. None of that would have been possible without Neil Adams. He also basically rescued the X-Men. He turned them into something or a property that from its original conception was almost dead at Marvel and basically resuscitated it. There have been... I think, what, seven different X-Men movies at this point or another? Neil Adams also did more political comics than almost anyone else with the Green Lantern and Green Arrow series, as well as the Superman versus Muhammad Ali comic, where you had them basically facing off against each other in a boxing match, but that actually was more about civil rights and Muhammad Ali's figure in that struggle than anything else. He also was the chief advocate behind some of the industry's biggest rights fights, for lack of a better term. He was one of the guys that pushed for a lot of unionization for creators and artists. Currently, for comic book artists, they get a percentage of everything that they draw that's within the comic, and most of their drawings are returned to them for a residual. It did not used to be that way. In the early 70s, He was one of the guys that really led the fight to basically rid practices of Marvel and DC and Warners taking advantage of comic book writers and illustrators. And one of the uh, primary creators of Marvel that basically has his name attached to just about every big Marvel property is Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby was on a deal with Marvel where... All of his creations were owned by Marvel, and even the comics that he had copies of, he was allowed to only store in his house, but couldn't sell them of his own volition. He was actually paying for, I believe, a rental fee for having copies of his own work. I mean, that's the level to which he was being taken advantage of in the 70s. And Neil Adams really put some clout behind trying to fight against Warner Brothers against DC, against Marvel, to try and really get established creators' rights behind all of these things. And his most famous fight was actually getting original credit and copyright back to Joel or uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, the guys who created Superman, who at nearly the end of their lives in the 1970s were destitute and had been fighting to get back the copyright that they originally sold to DC in the 1940s for 150 bucks at the time, given the millions upon millions of dollars that DC has earned from Superman, or excuse me, DC was not willing to give them any creator's rights or any type of residuals for their original creation because they had sold it. And as a result, the best they ended up getting, even with Neil Adams helping to fight for them, was a $20,000 pension for every year that they were still alive. 
but they at least had their names restored to the original byline as the creators. Because for a while, DC wouldn't even give them that. So he is one of the seminal people in the comic book industry, not just from a creation standpoint, but also from a labor creator's perspective. And so it's just a significant loss in in our community for anybody that really likes and appreciates artists and comic book history, more or less. And so with that being said, we uh, take a second here to recognize all of these people in the industry for their accomplishments with a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, let's go to best funniest lines. I picked out a few. Lieutenant Kiefer, there is no escape from the cane, save death. We're all doing penance. Sentenced to an outcast ship, manned by outcasts, and named after the greatest outcast of them all. I don't want to upset you too much, but at the moment, you have an excellent chance of being hanged. May win, even though I don't know why she's in this movie. I didn't mean to ruin your evening, I just bruise easily. Captain Queeg, Mr. Merrick, you may tell the crew for me that there are four ways of doing things aboard my ship. The right way, the wrong way, the Navy way, and my way. They do things my way, and we'll get along. Ensign Keith, sir, don't you like the Navy, do you? Lieutenant Kiefer, who called the cane the Navy? Dialogue between uh, Captain DeVries and uh, Ensign Keith. DeVries, disappointed they assigned you to a minesweeper, Keith? Ensign Keith, well, sir, to be honest, yes, sir. DeVries, you saw yourself on a carrier, or a battleship, no doubt. Yes, sir, I had hoped. Well, only hope that we're good enough for the cane. I shall try to be worthy of this assignment, sir. She's not a battleship or a carrier. The cane is a beaten-up tub. After 18 months of combat, it takes 24 hours a day just to keep her in one piece. Captain Queeg. Ah, but the strawberries. That's, that's where I had them. They laughed at me and made jokes, but I proved beyond the shadow of a doubt, and with geometric logic, that a duplicate key to the wardroom icebox did exist, and I'd have produced that key if they hadn't have pulled the cane out of action. I I know now that they're only trying to protect some fellow officers. Um, naturally, I, I can only cover these things roughly from memory, but if I've left out anything, why, you just ask me specific questions and I'll be perfectly happy to answer them. One by one. Captain Blakely. Mr. Greenwald, there can be no more serious charge against an officer than cowardice under fire. Lieutenant Greenwald. Sir, may I make one thing clear? It is not the defense's contention that Lieutenant Commander Quig is a coward. Quite to the contrary. The defense assumes that no man who rises to command a United States naval ship can possibly be a coward, and that, therefore... If he commits questionable acts under fire, the explanation must be elsewhere. I don't have any more. I have one. Lieutenant Kiefer, the first thing you have to learn about this ship is that she was designed by geniuses to be run by idiots. All right, let's go to the Stanley rubric then. I would normally ask you whether you want to go first or second, but given that you have such reverence for this movie and I don't feel the same way, I figure you're going to want the opportunity to respond to whatever digs I may or may not take at this movie. So I'll go first. Legacy. If this movie is remembered, it is by people much older than the median, cinephiles, or film historians. It's not remembered among Bogart's best, or maybe even in his top five, and the rest of the cast, if they are remembered at all by my generation or younger, had better roles. Fred McMurray in Double Indemnity, for example. Yet even the industry doesn't bestow great accolades on this movie. It can be in the conversation, but it's not among the greatest of its era or its genre. Thus, I have to go for a 3 for industry and a 1.5 for audience, and I'll add the topper that it's likely I wouldn't have heard of this movie or seen it if it weren't for either you or doing this show. (sighs) Tom, Tom, Tom. If you call me an ignorant slut, we're going to have a problem. I won't. This time this time. The industry really did like this film, and it did lead to a few more. I mean, 
Robert Francis' career took off from this film, uh, but for his untimely death, which I'll uh, be addressing in the remaining questions, who knows where he could have ended up. This is probably the last great performance of Bogart before he passed. So I think that the industry holds this in a little more esteem than you're giving it credit for. So I wanted the 3.5. Okay, As far as the public... <sighs> This again, as I, I point out, I uh, you know I was having uh, drinks to celebrate one of my employees' granddaughter today that was born, and uh, we were discussing the Kane mutiny. One uh, is in or sixty five or almost sixty five, two are in their thirties, close to your age, and me, and they are all heard of it. Obviously, the older guy had seen it, so. Given the fact that at least people who've seen it and are older revere it, and those younger don't, I went with a 2.5 being a division as far as older and younger for the public. So we're talking uh, six. All of your arguments for the industry have to do with in the moment as opposed to not right now. I don't think this has an enduring legacy. I think it has some historical legacy. But if you're just talking to a random person in the industry, how many of them actually know this movie? To me, that's the bigger question. And I don't think anecdotally, you constantly talking to the same group of guys, whether they've heard of certain movies. Anyway. Oh, well. The average between us is a four. Thanks for being a dick. (laughs) So the average between us is a 5.25. Impact significance. So this was the second highest grossing movie of the year. It had almost universal praise from critics at the time. It was based on a Pulitzer Prize winning book. It was Bogart's last great seminal work and last Oscar nomination. And it had a stellar cast. Other than not winning all of the awards and riding Bogart off into the sunset, this probably couldn't have been much bigger in the moment. So I went with a 4.5 for both, for a 9 overall. I went with the industry of 5 and uh, the public, 4.5. I have 9.5. The, the public loved the film. I think it portrayed an aspect of World War II that's not common in most films, which is that there were a lot of people who served who never actually saw much combat or saw much actual fighting or battle. There were a lot of people who spent their entire careers training others in the United States, teaching demolition. They were on ships that were doing things like hospital ships, etc. And I think this portrays an an aspect of the film that the public bought into, a lot of people did, where I think that the impact and significance is, is that there was a lot of veterans who this film spoke to. I mean, we had a lot of other films, another Van Johnson, Battleground film, you know, it's about the Battle of the Bulge. Not everybody experienced huge levels of combat. And I think this spoke to an entire group of veterans who did not have that experience, but still could relate and say, you know, that's kind of what it was to be on a ship that really didn't do much. Okay. Novelty. Oh, I suppose I should have given the average for the previous category, that was a 9.25 between us. Novelty. While it's based on a book, it really had to condense and rewrite a lot of the nuance that the book clearly intended. And while I don't think it entirely hit the mark, I could have done without the entire May Win plot line, as I've mentioned on multiple occasions already. I still think it was a decent accomplishment to have this movie be as decent as it was despite its complications in production. That being said, another war movie of the time was not novel either. And I struggle to find much that is daring about this except for the discussions of psychology. Nevertheless, I think they really could have expanded on that in the trial and given us more meat from the bone of where this movie really should have been drawing from. In a better version of this, the trial isn't the last half an hour, but rather the second and equal part of a movie like a Law and Order episode. So I feel about a four is probably right. Ooh. And I, I I gave it points down because, again, I agree with you that the love story is really contrived and pointless. It, it was to, 
I don't know, soften the film for a female audience. I, I, I don't know. I don't know why they would put it in here. It had no impact or significance to the overall film. In Hollywood, when you usually shoehorn a romance in, it's for a more generalized audience, yes. Well, anyway, so I gave it a, or points down for that. But just the fact that we're talking about psychology and the impact of war weariness and such, that was not a topic that was widely discussed. I mean, when, when you uh, talk about John Huston doing a film about post-traumatic stress disorder after World War II in the early 50s, this was novel for that, you know, to talk about mental illness and being having battle fatigue. So I think you went way too low on that aspect. So I went with an eight for novelty just because it, it, it touched a, uh, a thing that was not talked about. It was taboo in polite society to talk about, I mean, polite people didn't talk about their husbands waking up in the middle of the night screaming because they're dreaming about incoming fire and and the stress and the PTSD that resulted. This opened it up to have more polite conversations about it, I think. You're, you're dramatically too high, just grossly too high. There are plenty of other films that were discussing this. We even have one that was in our top uh, five for an extended period of time. I think it's still inside our top 10. The Best Years of Our Lives is a much better example of PTSD than this will ever be because it dances around the question instead of going directly at it. It never really brings it into the trial. They're just kind of tiptoeing around it. And that's why, let's go to classicness here, but first the average between us was a six. Classicness, I think some of the cross-examination aspects are suspect, and I wanted to scream malpractice at my TV a few times. But there isn't anything inherently difficult in subject matter or in practice that limits this other than this science of psychology where it feels extremely dated since PTSD hadn't even really been established at this point. But they're dancing around terms like that or trauma without actually knowing what they were. And as a result, therefore, this, I think, has probably about a point and a half down due to the issues I have with the cross-examination where we'll get to that in remaining questions and the fact that I actually don't think that they did well with the psychology of the time. They only were interested in probably prosecuting Kiefer for his alleging paranoia as opposed to the PTSD that allegedly was the trauma that Quig was suffering from. So I ended up at a 5.5 on the classic score. (sighs) Yeah, well, all right. I guess here we're going to differ again. I had an eight because I I think it just the fact that they're talking about it. I mean, you can, you can point to the best years of our lives. It's implied it's discussed, but it's not open and it's not dealt with as a psychological problem or an issue. It's not talked about within what could be a diagnosis versus this is what the person is experiencing and how they're living with it, returning home. I think this goes one step further and shows that there is actually something there that can be done and that there's an industry, a uh, medical treatment, a uh, medical program, however you want to phrase it, in the field of psychology that's starting to become, or burgeon, that's becoming relevant in society. And it could have been better? Yes. Could it have been worse? Well, a lot. And so... I gave it points up from that, and so that's where I come up with an 8. All right, so that's a 6.75 average between us. Rewatchability. This is a very slow movie. I'm sorry, it just is. Especially the first probably hour of this, is, and when we have all the May Wind shit sprinkled in. <laughs> the romantic angle could be removed in favor of much better and thought-out dialogue, and the courtroom scene should have been expanded so that we actually had some real stakes to that ending. It felt rushed instead of being the climactic moment that it should have been like it was in last week's film. Thus, it's in my, I won't mind if it's on range. So I'm at a 5.5. <sighs> Well, let's just say this. I love the film. You bought it for me because you know I love the film. I like rewatching it. A lot of times I'll pick a bunch of uh, military or war films and watch them around Memorial Day or Veterans Day. And this is one I watch on a regular basis. Do I 
go out of my way to watch it a lot. No. But, you know, like I said, every 12 to 18 months, I, I don't mind watching it. I like watching it. If it's on uh, Turner, you know, and I'm flipping around the stations, I'll sit and watch it and wherever it is and watch it for several minutes and possibly to the conclusion, depending on the hour by which it is. So I, I went with a, um, with a nine simply for that reason. So that's a 7.25 average between us. Audience score for this movie, we had an 87% for both Google and Rotten Tomatoes, giving us an 8.7. So to recap the categories, we had a 5.25 for Legacy, a 9.25 for Impact Significance, a 6 for Novelty, a 6.75 for Classicness, a 7.25 for Rewatchability, and an 8.7 for Audience Score, giving us a total of a 43.2. And I would currently place it between Oceans 13 and Sleepless in Seattle on the list. Okay. All right. Now, this is the difference, and I'll, I'll point this out, between being the lawyer's son who thinks he knows the law and the lawyer who's done 150 juries. Okay? Well, not all of them have to do with the cross-examination, but I know you've been waiting for my remaining questions then. On this. Okay, so let's go to the remaining questions. You have multiple, because you kept texting me about malpractice, and why didn't he do this, and why did I mean, I found very little wrong with what Barney Griz or Greenwald did in this film, uh, as far as a defense lawyer, uh, but I'd like to hear your criticisms. As a lawyer, aren't you committing malpractice by not objecting to whether your client liked or disliked someone? <sighs> And certainly, whether whether the crew or anybody else liked or disliked someone should not be admissible. It's hearsay. Okay. The question is, you have to ask, when you're listening or hearing testimony and you hear a question, which is worse, the impact of the answer or the fact that I now highlight it to a jury by objecting? It's irrelevant. The opinion of somebody's person has nothing to do with the circumstances by which he's being found on trial. Okay, that's not the issue. Again, you're, you're confusing things, which is you have to evaluate in every situation what the impact is of it. And if there's nothing that you can say that this is damaging one way or the other, why object? It makes little difference. I don't know. Every time he kept asking, well, is it a matter that you just simply did this because you didn't like Captain Queeg? Objection? That would never fly in a modern court system. Uh, yeah, it would. You, you have, I mean, you have greater latitude on cross-examination than you ever did on direct. And you can get into opinions and you can, and, and that's proper impeachment as, or motive under under federal rule 908 point, I want to say it's 18, indicates that you can impeach by bias and personal opinion. I don't know. Every time he just sat there and didn't object to anything, it just made me scratch my head. Like I said, there are times when, when you object to something because it's damaging and actually helpful to your case, all right? I would purposely object to something that was helpful to my case and then have the judge rule, you know, overruled because it emphasized it to the jury, okay? It's a tactic because you have to remember Okay, I don't care how many times you ask a question and the judge says sustained, the jury is to disregard the testimony of the claimant or the, the witness in response to that question. Yeah, sure. The jury's sitting there like banging their head, uh, dumping this information out of their ears so they don't remember it. You constantly ask questions you know are going to be objected to, and you know they're illegal because you want the other side to object because then it emphasizes the exact point you're trying to make. 
So what you're saying is in a courtroom setting, it pays to be more audacious. Yes. The timid lose. All right. The rest aren't really having to do with the courtroom lawyering because even with uh, McMurray's character, they kind of explain that away kind of in the same precision that you just did. Were the officers of the cane really guilty because Quig had asked for help? I don't maintain that he actually, A, asked for help, B, would have accepted the help had they given it to him, or C, actually trusted any of them if they had been at all nice to him. He was already to the point where he had undermined himself. Well, I think you have an obligation in that situation to express loyalty to the person placed in charge. If at that point they reject it or minimize it, then you have your answer. But I think you have an obligation to at least try. I know that's what this film is setting up, and I'm sure it's a much more difficult situation in a military setting than otherwise. I mean, it's one thing to be undermining of your boss, especially in modern culture, in a work setting. But when you do it in you know, the Navy or the Marines, that's when people die to uh, bring in last week's movie. So I guess I can't project the same type of situation that I've never been a part of into this movie. But for me, it didn't seem like he had earned the trust or loyalty of anybody else due to his rather manic behavior. True. But I think... When you're in that situation, you're part of a team and you're trying to survive a crisis. Now, I'm going to ask this, knowing full well it's not the actual answer, but are there really only two forms of leadership, paranoid disciplinarian or loose confidence? And I ask this primarily because that seems to be the gap between my parents' leadership styles. (laughs) (laughs) oh oh, well let's just start by saying fuck you tom second leadership can be expressed in multiple ways and one aspect of leadership sometimes is is letting people operate and to see what level they can achieve on their own with encouragement and oversight okay There's another aspect, which is one of the things that I learned uh, a long time ago, which I I figured out myself, um, but actually found an article one time that indicated that FDR did this, which is active procrastination, which is that when people come in to complain about something or demand you deal with a situation, you automatically say, yep, yep, I agree, and then and I'm going to take care of it, and then don't do anything. And you go through this little scenario about two or three times, and by the time the third one's done, they've lost the steam by which they were ticked off, and the matter results without you having to do anything. And they're seemingly happy because at the moment in time where they're like, that's when you really go, I'm going to take care of this and I'm going to fire them or I'm going to give them a warning and I'm going to, you know, you can't, or at that point, they're almost going, no, 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 it's okay. You don't need to do it. There's different management levels. So it's a style. And sometimes it's a matter of just determining what is or is not reasonable in the circumstances. So everything that you described, I would put in the category of loose confidence. Okay, well, I don't think it quite is as general as that because there are other times where you have to actually get involved in situations, but you need to be able to carefully select. (laughs) All right, so let's just talk about raising children, being you guys. Okay, we had the drill sergeant who was in there covering every little aspect of everything. And then you had the individual who was kind of like the overseer, who when things were out of control, you would go to and say, hey, um, so-and-so is doing this, this, and this, and that's not right. Okay, I'll talk to him or her. All right? 
and you, you resolve the situation. And then there are times where you exceed a certain level or a certain point. And the person who is a fairly level-headed and non-confrontational gets really ticked off and takes a more aggressive position. Okay. Those are probably the extremes. And then a lot of people in a lot of situations fall in between those levels. Finally, was Van Johnson right in taking command of the ship? I suppose I should say Merrick. Yes, he was. Because simply because Kui kept freezing. Okay, and at the point in time where you lose the ability to be rational, I mean, you have to understand, most people are in situations under stress where they stop thinking clearly and rationally. There are some people who just, everything slows down around them and they see things much clearer. And Quig at that point in time was no longer able to operate uh, the ship adequately and to address the concerns and situation at hand. Merrick was, whether it be taking on ballast to help keep the ship upright uh, turning the direction of the ship to uh, compensate for the waves and the wind. He had very little choice. Did you have any remaining questions? Yeah, I, I, I have a few. What could the career of Robert Francis have been? This was his first film. He was a relatively unknown, but he then did uh, The Road West, The uh, Bomb Sioux Prison, Long Gray Line, which is a John Ford film. He died in a plane crash. He was like 24 or 25 when he, or somewhere 26 when he died. He had done four films and seemed to be moving along. Uh, did he have actual star quality based on your seeing of his performance in this? You know, what could have happened had he not died in that plane crash? Did you have any others? I, I Just a... <laughs> Just uh, in my research, I, I, I happen to see something that, uh, as we uh, discuss LGBTQ plus rights and such, just the sheer strange way Hollywood handled stuff. About the time this film was made, there was a lot of rumors in Hollywood that Van Johnson was gay, which he was. But he had a very close uh, relationship with a woman. And so the studio said, you need to get married because we don't want our one of our major stars. I believe it was uh, Columbia with Harry Cohn who said, uh, you know, we don't want one of our major stars to be outed. So you need to get married. And he said, no, I don't want to get married. I don't like women. The only women I, woman I like is this one. They said, fine, then you'll marry her. Well, at the time she was married to Keenan Wynn who's a longtime character actor and such. So the studio told Keenan Wynn that if he didn't divorce his wife, they were going to terminate his contract. So he did. And so after Keenan Wynn divorced his wife, his wife married Van Johnson, and they remained married for 20 years. The studio or helped set up an arrangement where basically the three of them lived together, and so she and Keenan Wynn remained husband and wife, but it gave the illusion that Van Johnson was married. Ah, good old Hollywood. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We will be back next week. Thank you for listening. Where are you headed, cowboy? Nowhere special? Nowhere special. I always wanted to go there. Next week, we will be discussing the last entry in Military Courtroom Drama Month, Judgment at Nuremberg from 1961. Directed by Stanley Kramer, written by Abby Mann, starring Maximilian Schell, Spencer Tracy, Judy Garland, Marlena Dietrich, Montgomery Clift, and Burt Lancaster. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that more can join in and are fun. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com to sign up for our newsletter, or find us on Instagram, Twitter, or now TikTok at the handle at gmodepodcast. 
The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM.